You know, in the ICU, we try to deliver mechanical ventilation, usually in the form of partial assist, or where the breaths are delivered uh, in theory in synchrony with the patient's own breathing. But uh, these last years, we noticed very often that uh, there were desynchrony between the patient and the ventilator, and this is what I'm going to briefly uh, describe. Uh, these are the companies with which we have been uh, lucky to work uh, for getting some equipment or some uh, uh, funding for uh, research grants. So I'm very grateful to these companies and you will have to decide whether this uh, can influence my judgment. This is a, what we call conflict of interest. So a um, number of years ago, uh, uh, we did a prospective study where we look at all patients under assisted or partial ventilation in the ICU uh, and look at the frequency of uh, asynchrony. And we found that uh, approximately one quarter of the patients had the, uh, a large number of asynchrony. Arbitrarily, we defined this uh, using an asynchrony index, which is a number of breaths which are completely asynchronous with the ventilator. And uh, we found that there was a very clear association between uh, a longer uh, duration of mechanical ventilation, as indicated on this uh, graph. And uh, despite the fact that uh, these patients were not particularly more severe, there, there was a tendency for having more COPD in this group, but uh, gas exchange, tidal volume did not look so... Um, did not look worse. So there, there was specific associated with asynchrony and poor outcome. And we reasoned that maybe uh, there is something to do better in delivering ventilation. This was confirmed in other study in the ICU. Uh, uh, this is study by Marjolaine De Witt who found approximately the same incidence, the same association with long-term outcome, uh, with um, duration of mechanical ventilation, even when using a multivariable model adjusting for severity uh, factors. Uh, and uh, the group of Louis Blanc, who will, uh, Louis will deliver a lecture um, after me on um, monitoring asynchrony, uh, even found that there was a significant association with mortality. Do uh, all asynchrony matters? We don't know yet. Uh, there are different types of asynchrony which have been described. Uh, but recently, uh, uh, Dimitris, our uh, chairman, made an important observation uh, saying that, well, maybe having one asynchrony from time to time, and they focused here on ineffective efforts, may not uh, matter so much. But having uh, what they call clusters of asynchrony and uh, they, they illustrate here the, uh, on, on, you see here the time scale uh, uh, where you have uh, occurrence here of a large number of asynchrony over a relatively short period of time. These clusters of ineffective effort, which they called events in this study, where uh, those specially associated with poor outcome, you see the association with a longer uh, duration of ICU stay, during longer duration of total minute uh, mechanical ventilation time, and especially the time after the start of the winning period. So, uh, and of course it makes a lot of sense, so they gave a definition of this cluster, uh, and it's a step forward uh, causality between uh, having uh, asynchrony and having a poor outcome because it makes more sense to see that when uh, you have a lot of asynchrony at the same time over a short period, it may have an impact on patient physiology and outcome. So what's a bit complicated today is that uh, we tend to put all asynchrony in the same uh, big bag. However, they are very different, uh, they are very different asynchrony which have different mechanism. And, and to uh, make things a little bit uh, simpler, not too simple, I hope, uh, I, I will separate some asynchrony associated with assistance delivered in excess and as asynchrony associated with assistance uh, insufficient uh, regarding the need of the patient. 
And when uh, you deliver assistance in excess, which is very easy to achieve with pressure support ventilation, you may have apnea or you may have ineffective efforts. Um, this is a classical example of uh, tracings uh, you can observe on the ventilator where everything looks very regular and very nice and uh, which in fact is in reality completely asynchronous because if you look at uh, what the patient is doing and this is the electrical activity of the diaphragm and the very very small PDI swing you see that in fact the patient is breathing here uh, is doing a very weak effort at the end of this weak effort it's triggering the breast and the insufflation is delivered completely passively so it looks like a very regular and, and smooth uh, pressure support assist ventilation but it's uh, in fact the alternance of a very weak effort by the patient and uh, passively delivered the controlled breast so it's uh, completely uh, asynchronous and uh, because it's associated with excessive ventilation as indicated by the very low drive it's uh, usually associated with uh, with periods of apnea you see interestingly it's not complete apnea in terms of central drive but these efforts are so weak that uh, they do not trigger anymore the ventilator and these periods of apnea have been shown, for instance, for patients with, uh, who are sleeping on the ventilator or trying to sleep, to induce repeated episodes of arousal or awakening. In this uh, nice study by Sai Bartasarati and uh, Tobin, you see on the tracing of tidal volume, for instance, the repeated episode of apnea, which were associated on the EEG pattern with repeated awakening and arousal. So if you imagine a patient uh, always trying to go to sleep and always having this experience, experiencing this episode of apnea and arousal and awakening, this can be terrible and for instance, be a good reason to worsen outcome. So this is the first thing uh, I think we clinicians should be uh, attentive to when we see uh, the alarm of low minute ventilation on pressure support in uh, most of the cases it's because we give too much pressure support especially when patients try to sleep the next thing which will happen especially if the patient has some degree of obstructive lung disease is a triggering asynchrony or ineffective effort which was initially uh, nicely shown by um, Chao et al. in this uh, group of patients with uh, chronic ventilator dependence. And uh, what you see here are the breasts delivered by the ventilator. This is assist control, but this could be pressure support. And when you look at the esophageal pressure tracing, you see every uh, bar, vertical bar, uh, indicates an effort made by the patient. And when you look at the uh, scale of the pressure, it, it's not it's not very very small effort it's relatively large efforts and you see that uh, one effort two effort and three effort only the third one is triggering the ventilator so there is a complete dissociation between the number of effort done by the patient and the assistance given by the ventilator which is at a much lower rate uh, and the issue here is both timing and the amount of uh, pressure or volume delivered. Timing is very well illustrated here. This is what you see on the vent. This is pressure support triggered by the patient. This is the flow. And this is what the patient is doing in reality. So you see the timing is not good because the patient is starting to work well before the ventilator can detect the uh, uh, start of uh, the effort and this is because there is some degree of intrinsic PEEP not huge amount maybe two three centimeters of water and at the time the breast is uh, is uh, recognized by the patient the patient has almost finished his own inspiration 
then the ventilator gives the pressure maybe to an excessive amount and an excessive tidal volume. So the combination of this desynchrony in time plus the excessive amount of pressure and volume makes that for the next effort, which occurs exactly at the same normal TIT tote for the patient, uh, there will be slightly more intrinsic PEEP and for this next effort, the patient will be completely unable to trigger the ventilator or if you wish, the ventilator will be unable to detect patient's um, um, effort. So this is the cause of ineffective triggering and in, it's an association with a wrong timing and excessive level of ventilation. So you can try to work on the timing. For instance, in this study, we, we took benefit of having the, the monitoring of the electrical activity of the diaphragm to try to start earlier the uh, detection of the effort by adjusting the external PEEP and try to better adjust the uh, cycling um, on the ventilator. But this uh, is a complicated technique and maybe the simplest way to do uh, the adjustment in terms of uh, pressure and volume is simply to reduce the uh, pressure support level or to reduce the time of delivery of pressure support uh, by adjusting the uh, expiratory uh, cycling uh, mechanism. So in those uh, patients who had a large number of asynchrony, we tried to see what was the best technique to reduce uh, ineffective efforts. Uh, we try whether ad uh, adjusting PEEP was a good uh, approach, whether optimal pressure support was a good approach, and by optimal, we just try to optimize. I'm not saying it's the best in the world, but it was optimized. Uh, or optimizing the inspiratory time by increasing the expiratory threshold. And we find that the simplest technique, the uh, reduction of pressure support, was very efficient to uh, reduce asynchrony. You see the, the uh, asynchrony index, which uh, was completely normalized in many patients. You also see that in, in some patients, uh, even by adjusting the ventilator, we could not change the degree of asynchrony. So asynchrony may be related to her own settings, but sometimes maybe mostly related to patient's characteristics. So at the opposite of these two kind of asynchrony I showed you, the apnea and the ineffective efforts, you have uh, asynchrony related to insufficient assistance. And we talk a lot about this one because they, uh, we now focus our attention on, on this type of asynchrony occurring, for instance, in ARDS, where you see uh, double triggering, breast tacking, and short cycles. So. By under assistance, I mean that the uh, amount of ventilation or the duration of uh, mechanical insufflation is not sufficient compared to patients' own uh, neural breathings. So this again would be indicated by the esophageal pressure swing. And you see that the end of patient's effort is after the end of the insufflation, which make these uh, weird tracings or this uh, uh, abnormal expiratory flow pattern, if you wish, because there is still some patient's effort during the early phase of expiration. And of course, uh, this is another patient, it then can induce a double triggering, so because the patient is still uh, um, trying to, to get air, he, he may have a double triggering. And uh, we have data indicating, for instance, that the lower the tidal volume, the higher is the frequency of this problem, and the higher will be the work of reading uh, um, performed by the patient. And then we may see this kind of tracing during assist control, where we have frequent double triggering or even triple triggering. And the reason is that we tend to use relatively high flow, short inspiratory time for patients who have high respiratory drive. So this is the best combination to have this problem of double triggering or triple triggering. And of course, if we think that six milliliters per kilogram is the way to go, you deliver 12 or even 18 milliliters per kilogram frequently, 
which uh, may impact, again, the outcome of the patient. However, this issue uh, is a little bit more complicated because some of these double triggering may not be double triggering, but maybe double cycling, and may be caused by a phenomenon which has been described before as respiratory entrainment and which we call reverse triggering, indicating that the ventilator is triggering the muscular, muscular contraction and not the opposite. Though this uh, is a paper which uh, we published with uh, Evangelia Akumianaki and Jean-Christophe Richard a few years ago, uh, describing a series of patients with ARDS and their deep sedation, uh, in whom we found a very frequent occurrence of uh, um, breast uh, contraction induced by the ventilator. And you see here that every other breath, there is first a small increase in the esophageal pressure, indicating that the beginning of insufflation is passive, and there is an abrupt decrease in uh, esophageal pressure, indicating a contraction. In fact, it started by an accidental observation. We wanted to observe the very early phase when the patient will start to trigger the ventilator. And we took this patient who was on pressure control ventilation. And as you can see, there was absolutely no indication that the patient was triggering the ventilator. This was exactly the respiratory rate of the ventilator. We put uh, a NAVA catheter, which allows to monitor the electrical activity of the diaphragm. And to our, to our surprise, we found that at every breath, there was an activity of the diaphragm, which was in fact a very strong activity. But when we looked at the timing between the ventilator and the patient's effort, you see that the effort of the patient started in the middle of the insufflation. And when we modified the respiratory rate on the ventilator, we modified the respiratory rate of the patient. So these diaphragmatic contractions were not coming initially from the brain of the patient, but we are triggered by some reflex after the beginning of the mechanical insufflation. And the consequences could be that uh, this uh, contraction increased the tidal volume. For instance, you see here every other breath, there is an increase in tidal volume because of this uh, reverse triggering. Or it could induce these double cycles, which are not double triggering, because the first one is not triggered by the patient, but the second one is triggered by this reverse triggering phenomenon. And we think this is very important to recognize, because these are very deeply sedated patients. And in these patients, there, is only, there are only two solutions to avoid that. One could be to go back to paralysis. The other one would be to decrease sedation. So this uh, would lead to a very different management compared to the classical uh, uh, double triggering. Uh, so this is an illustration uh, again from uh, a review that we did with uh, TIFAM, where we superimpose the EDI in a patient who had a frequent uh, double cycling. And you see that uh, uh, it's, it becomes obvious that the first breath is fully controlled then there is this diaphragmatic contraction which triggers the second breath. And without such a monitoring like EDI or esophageal pressure, it may be very difficult to detect and to understand. Uh, and we have a number of studies uh, looking at uh, the impact of this dyssynchrony. I would like just to briefly show you a preliminary result of uh, two studies which are ongoing. One is a study where we look at the first time the patient start to use their diaphragm, and uh, we put a nava catheter at the time of intubation. And we uh, realized that for most of the patient, the first type of uh, diaphragmatic activity is not a normal triggering, but is reverse triggering. And in fact, um, this is a series of patients. I think it was shown yesterday by uh, Ricard in the abstract. Uh, we took uh, patients on assist control ventilation. We found that uh, reverse triggering was present in almost all the patients 
the first day of uh, assist control uh, ventilation. And in 40% uh, of the patients, so it's a very sensitive detection, but in 40% of the patients, more than 10% of their breaths were reverse triggering. So we do believe it's a very, very frequent phenomenon. And in ARDS, uh, we think it may have an impact on outcome. So we, th is, we think we may need to monitor this phenomenon and maybe to have a specific management. But for that, we are collecting data in an observational study co called Breathing Effort in ARDS, the BEARD study, which is ongoing. We don't have results from this study, but we already have a lot of tracing showing this kind of uh, um, uh, typical reverse triggering where again you see the esophageal pressure going up and then uh, going down at the same, uh, almost the same pattern every other breast with uh, typical uh, breast stacking. So whether this is associated with outcome, we, we don't know yet, but uh, if uh, it turns out to be associated with poor outcome, I think it should uh, probably change our management. Um, these are other examples. And uh, as uh, uh, we discussed this morning about uh, studies of uh, low PEEP and high PEEP, you may have noticed that no one of the studies performed to date have uh, paid any attention to this problem of asynchrony. Uh, in the R trial, which showed a higher mortality rate with high PEEP, uh, some investigator, I think one investigator called Marcelo from Brazil, made some recordings and uh, found that in fact uh, a lot of patients had uh, asynchrony in the form of double triggering or reverse triggering. And you could imagine that uh, this asynchrony could be much more uh, injurious if you have a, already start from a high PEEP than a low PEEP. So one explanation of this negative trial could be asynchrony. So in the future, if we don't pay attention to that, we will continue to have uh, unexplained uh, negative uh, randomized trial. So there are many clinical consequences of asynchrony or clinical association, I should say. And this is why I think we need to pay more attention. This is just a long list saying that it may indicate sometimes excessive or insufficient ventilatory assistance, it may indicate dynamic hyperinflation, inadequate sedation, it may be associated with sleep fragmentation, certainly associated with errors in assessing winning readiness, uh, it is associated with prolonged duration of ventilation, maybe with respiratory sequelae and, and mortality. Uh, we need to figure out what is causal, what is just simple association. Uh, and this is a, a very exciting challenge for the future. Thank you very much.